meeting everyone. Thank you very much for coming out on such a wet and cold night. We appreciate it. Welcome to the John McEntee Memorial Lecture on the Mountain. I'm Clive Baldwin, I'm the Director at the Centre for Interdisciplinary Research on Narrative, under whose auspices the lecture takes place. And I'll just give a few comments about CERN and itself, and then introduce our speaker tonight. This year, CERN has welcomed new members, and we've been very active. Bill and Matt Robinson have a contract with the University of Toronto to edit a book on older adults, narrative and cherished objects, which members of CERN are, are, are writing chapters uh, together and alone. So we're very pleased with that. Narrative Works, our open access international peer review journal, edited by Beth Kim and uh, Bill Randall, going ahead, and we welcome Randy S. Bert as managing editor of that <laughs> journal. And we're pleased to um, welcome Michelle Greeson, uh, who is I think, her postdoctoral work with us on narrative care, developing a training, train the trainer program in narrative care and older adults. So welcome Michelle. Okay. Um, as is usual with this, that we invite you tomorrow morning if you wish if anyone wants to come to CERN uh, at 10 o'clock, which is three, room 313 in this building, um, to continue a conversation with Bill, we'll be there to welcome you. Uh, feel free to come. Okay. So, Gary Kenyon was going to do the introduction, um, but he's uh, going to be here, so he sent me uh, his, his introduction. <laughs> Dr. Bill Randall was born, as he would say, at a very young age, and grew up in Harvey Station, New Brunswick. He received his education at Harvard and Princeton Theological Seminary. And for some ten years, he was an ordained to United Church Minister. He made a major change in his journey and moved to Toronto, where he completed his doctorate of, in it, of education, and authored the book, The Stories We Are. In 1995, he moved back to Fredericton, and was offered a position in the gerontology department. Since that time, he has and continues to make a major contribution as a teacher, scholar, and valued colleague, both here and international. He's co-founder of Narrative Gerontology, a specialisation of gerontology that has developed an enthusiastic following around the world. He's a central figure in the creation of the centre here, and, and indeed created my post, for which I am grateful. <laughs> <laughs> Bill and, and Beth also created Narrative Matters, a series of biennial conferences which brings together researchers and practitioners from many disciplines together. It's held every two years. It's been held in New Brunswick, Paris, the Netherlands, British Columbia. In 2020, it'll convene in Atlanta and maybe 2022 in Finland. If this wasn't enough, Dr. Randall has also been co-authored numerous books and journal articles dealing with narrative research and narrative care practice. It's part of a movement that is changing the face of the story of long-term care and of ageing in the community by what we call taking gerontology to the streets. The image of ageing and even frailty is changing from deficits, decline and neglect or ageism to ageing as a lifelong journey of meaningful change, respect for all persons and inclusion. Bill's work is making a significant contribution to this vision. <coughs> it's an honour and a great pleasure, personally and professionally, to welcome Dr. Bill Randall. Well, thank you very much, Clive, for that introduction, and also to Gary Kenyon for the introduction via you. Uh, I wanted to say a, a warm shout out to Dolores Furlong who is co-founder of Narrative Matters 2002 and 2004, along with me and others here at St. Thomas, and uh, it's uh, happily still going on quite strongly. I want to thank Julian Walker for the tie that I'm wearing tonight. I don't tend to wear a tie very often, but he gave me this tie, and now I'm decided I should wear it. Uh, nice to see uh, many of you, I was going to say old, familiar faces, but that wouldn't be appropriate in this context, so familiar faces, many unfamiliar ones. 
uh, students, etc. So I would like to uh, to begin. It's a, it's a great honor to be asked to uh, to have been asked to give this uh, lecture, uh, and we've had some wonderful uh, lectures uh, over the years. And of course, we are deeply uh, uh, indebted to and honoring of uh, John McEnany, uh, in whose name uh, the lecture series has been established. So uh, if I could just uh, start by paying homage to, to John, um, as well as to uh, who passed away, um, died, died actually uh, in difficult circumstances uh, about 11 years ago, if I'm not mistaken, uh, last week. Uh, my mother is next in the uh, big picture up here, and that uh, is her uh, with a new friend, where she lives at Winter Court, and she celebrated her 98th birthday today. Uh, and then next uh, here is my dear friend Bob Miller, uh, who's been a dear friend to many of us, and uh, we have a special kayaking connection. Uh, over the years, he left this lake on October 27th. Um, so this time of year, poised between Halloween on the one hand and Remembrance Day on the other, our thoughts incline rather naturally toward death. Uh, it's horror, it's honor, our fear of it, and our fascination with it as well. Death is at once a depressing topic, um, a taboo topic, an intriguing topic, and a topic uh, of added interest to me personally since my father uh, died, that's him on the lower right, uh, on the first day of spring in 2017. I was with him when he did, and uh, it was an odd but powerful experience for which I'm forever grateful. As a narrative gerontologist, I'm interested in aging and in stories. And stories tend to have beginnings, middles, and ends, while aging, alas, is viewed by many, I'm afraid, in negative terms as effectively the end of the road, as a narrative of decline, a downward drift toward decrepitude and death. That is a general view that prevails out there in the wider world, not in this room, I'm sure. So I thought, why not try to kill a few birds with one stone, if I may, and begin bringing together certain strands of thinking on the topic of death that uh, have been swirling around inside of my head for some time. Uh, but I stress the word begin, uh, apart from a few pages that Beth McKim and I devoted to the topic of death in our book, Reading Our Lives. This is my first serious and very preliminary foray into territory that I, in fact, traversed on automatic pilot during my days as a parish minister uh, with the United Church of Canada when I was dealing with death directly or indirectly on a more or less weekly basis, whether it was visiting folks in hospital, assisting them or their loved ones in coping with mortality, or speaking about them at their funeral. As a narrative gerontologist, I look at aging through a narrative lens, which enables us, I think, to see the more complex inside of aging, plus to see the more positive potential that aging possesses regarding things like meaning and wisdom and spirituality. Looking at death through a narrative lens, I think, can help us to see it, too, in a more positive light. So with that in mind, I'd like to explore four broad themes with you this evening. One is endings in stories, death in life, narrative openness in life, and narrative openness in death. Before I begin, I have three quick disclaimers. First of all, the perspectives that I'll be advancing uh, in this talk are not meant to reflect those of the gerontology department in general. Uh, second, they concern the concept of death in general, not the process of dying, which is, of course, part of life. And third, this is not a funeral oration. I'm not <laughs> pretending to speak to those of you who might be mourning the deaths of particular loved ones, whether those deaths be timely, untimely, terrible, tragic, whatever. That said, if what I say affords you some comfort in your grief, if it reduces the sting of death in some way, if it helps you to feel more at home in the universe, and if it helps you to experience more stillness, as Gary Kenyon would say, then so much the better. So, endings in stories. <coughs> the counterpart to death in life I'm going to propose in my very simplistic way is the ending in a story. We expect a story to have a beginning, a middle, and eventually an end, if not necessarily in that order as can be the case with detective shows, which in a sense start at the end with a murder that's been committed and look back to the beginning to who did the dirty deed and why. So whether it's a whodunit, a novel, or a movie, we expect the story, whatever exactly that phrase means, to at some point draw to a close. Let me take as an example the Netflix series Shetland, which I confess to being, having been addicted to this past <laughs> summer. 
one episode picks up threads from previous episodes to carry the main storyline a wee bit further, while one season picks up sh uh, themes from previous seasons and carries the Shetland story world as a whole that much further still. As viewers, though, we know that we're not ultimately in the realm of the proverbial never-ending story, and that the series must at some point wind up. Now back in September, by the way, are there any Shetland fans here? Oh good. <laughs> back in September, I knew there was only one episode left in the final season that Netflix had available at the time to view. There are five seasons in total. So I kept putting off watching that final episode for nearly a week or more because I couldn't bear no longer having the Shetland story world to crawl back inside of at the end of my day to enjoy the chemistry between the core characters and to savor the scenery. Ah, the scenery. <laughs> that story world felt so comforting that I didn't want the feeling to end. In viewing each episode, my sense of an ending, as literary critic Frank Cremode would say, uh, was intensifying, yet I wanted to delay <coughs> that ending as long as I could. A story needs a sense of an ending for it to be aesthetically satisfying. Which brings us to the topic of soap operas. Well, I've never been much for daytime soap operas like Days of Our Lives, which my mother watched faithfully until her macular degeneration made TV watching of any kind not so pleasurable anymore. I confess to having been addicted to primetime soaps like ER and Nashville in much the same way as I've become addicted to uh, Shetland. Yet in each case, endings in any final sense were perpetually postponed, even if each string brought the much-touted season finale to afford us a provisional <coughs> feeling of catharsis to tide us over the summer. Postponed indefinitely, or provided on a provisional basis, our sense of an ending lends an intensity to our experience of every episode and within every episode of every event. Seasons, episodes, events, all are pervaded by the deep-seated sense that this is leading somewhere, and that the current scene could therefore matter, perhaps hugely, in the end. In the case of Shetland, I'm talking about my sense that the season would eventually wrap up. Uh, and after I watched the final episode uh, of that season that I had available to me, I was basically between stories, as the theologian Thomas Berry would put it, and I entered a state, a state of mourning almost until I found another series to crawl inside of. In fact, I'm still, uh, because somewhere inside in my brain there lurks the sense that out there off of Scotland's northeastern coast, Detective Inspector Jimmy Perez is still traipsing around the wilds of Shetland solving crime. <laughs> That's the thing about endings in stories. They're never truly final. Take a fairy tale, the kind that begins with once upon a time. Even though the words the end come at, well, the end, they're commonly preceded by a phrase like, and they'll all live happily ever after, which implies that there is actually no end at all, rather more of a beginning. Postmodern literary theorist J. Hillis Miller argues that the whole idea of endings in fictional texts is, in fact, highly ambiguous. Quote, the notion of ending is inherently undecidable. He writes in a classic article entitled The Problematic of Ending in Narrative, quote, no novel can be unequivocally finished, he says, quote, or for that matter, unequivocally unfinished. He goes even further, dragging beginnings and not just endings into the mix, quote, no narrative can show either its beginning or its end. It always begins and ends still in medias res. If I pronounce that correctly, thank you. In the midst, to use Frank Kermode's phrase, I find Miller's point intriguing. In other words, there's always a time before the once upon and a time beyond the end in the realm of happily ever after, and both times constitute the open-ended boundaries of the tale. But there's another way to look at this busyness, this business of beginninglessness and endlessness. We arrive at the last word on the last page, and in that sense, the book grinds to a halt, but not the story. For any novel worth its salt will afford us no end of things to talk about and no end of themes to, to uh, discuss in the book club that we may belong to. The story's meaning, if you like, is indeterminate, open-ended. As a result, writes J. Hillis Miller, quote, it's impossible to tell whether a given narrative is complete, unquote. Completion can be mistaken for conclusion, yet a book can conclude without the story that it hosts be being remotely complete. The term 
Closure is therefore relevant as well. Arabic fiction scholar Ibrahim Taha distinguishes between two types of closure in fiction, closed and open. Closed closure, he says, is characterized by well-defined solutions to all the questions and problems that the story has raised and leaves no room for more questions. As in many detective novels, once we find out who's who done it, that's all we need to know. End of story. Open closure, on the other hand, is, he says, quote, the absence of answers and solutions to questions and conflicts <coughs> introduced in the story. Instead of open closure, literary scholar <coughs> Gary Morrison uses the word aperture, as in a camera. Discussing Tolstoy's novels War and Peace and Anna Karenina, both of which were written in installments, he says that, quote, in neither work is there ever a moment when all threads are tied together and the impression of completeness is offered. Closure was to be replaced, he said, by aperture. A work that employs <coughs> aperture renounces the privilege of an ending. There will be no final ending, only a potentially, potentially infinite series of relative closures, each encouraging a provisional assessment made in the knowledge that it will have to be revised." Unquote. So, to cut a long story short, the very concept of endings in stories seems to be enigmatic. Indeed, all the more so when it comes to the stories that we might write about ourselves. And I know there are people here from a life writing group uh, who write stories about their own lives, which is fantastic. Hats off to Vivian Edwards and those of you who belong to that group. Uh, so when it comes to autobiographies, here's something from the uh, a pioneer of narrative psychology by the name of Jerome Bruner. He says, he says, no autobiography is completed, only ending. This kind of muddies the water I'm trying to, to explore here. But as simultaneously, the author, narrator, and protagonist of that version of the story of my life that comes to the fore in the course of telling it or writing it, I write about my life not from beginning to end, but in a sense from the end to the beginning. In an article with that phrase, from the end to the beginning, as its title, psychologist Jens Brockmeyer reflects on the weird nature of autobiographical time. An autobiography, he says, is a story that is simultaneously about the past, the present, and the process in which both merge, and it is about the future as well, about the future that starts in the very moment the story is told. An autobiography, he explains, it's kind of a mind twister, is an account given by a narrator in the here and now about a protagonist bearing his name or her name who existed in the there and then. And this is only how it starts. Usually when the story terminates in the present, the present that looks into the future, the protagonist has fused with the narrator. I tell a story about someone who in the course of this story turns out to be me, the I who has been telling the story all the time. <laughs> I find that <laughs> So, next cheery topic, death in life. Switching from endings and stories to death in life. Death in general, I will suggest tonight, is also an ambiguous concept. In a book entitled The Field by science journalist Lynn McTaggart, who's also a Scot, I believe, <coughs> outlines research at the cutting edge of numerous scientific disciplines that points to the existence of a zero-point field underlying our physical universe. At the heart of all things, in other words, is no thing at all. Or rather, as she says, in the space between things, there is an ocean of microscopic vibrations a heaving sea of energy, one vast quantum field. The, the narrative of nature that prevails in many people's minds, though, is one in which the universe, with its billions of galaxies and zillions of stars, its dark matter, its black holes, and its vast interstellar spaces, is deemed to be devoid of meaning, purpose, and except on our precious little planet, life. But contrary to that narrative, says McTaggart, there is, quote, a life force flowing through the universe within which everything is connected to everything else like some invisible web. In the very undercoat of our being, she says, all of us connect with each other and the world, unquote. On the topic of death in particular, and drawing on researchers such as Robert Yan of Princeton University and Fritz Albert Popp of Marburg University, McTaggart lends scientific credence to the idea, quote, that individual consciousness doesn't die, unquote. <coughs> Indeed, quote, consciousness may live on after we die, unquote. As Pop describes things, when we die, we experience a decoupling of our unique frequency of vibrations from the matter of ourselves, unquote. Thus, says McTaggart, 
Death may be merely a matter of going home, or more precisely, staying behind, returning to the field. In a more restrained manner, biogerontologist Leonard Hayfleck argues that when we look at life from a strictly scientific perspective, the dividing line between our individual existence and that of the cosmos as a whole is, well, non-existent. And so, by extension, is the line between life and death. In a section entitled, How Old Are You Really?, from his book, How and Why We Age, which I bought at Frenchies many years ago, <laughs> have clung to ever since because it's so well written. Here's what Leonard Fleck Hayflick says. Most of the cells present in our body today were not present five or ten years ago. The cells themselves consist of smaller units called molecules, and all of your molecules are composed of atoms, most of which have been the same since our planet formed. We are really composed of billion-year-old atoms. We might actually claim to be immortal. In that sense, says Hayfleck, we're all billion-year-olds no matter when we were born, and he adds, and therefore celebrating birthdays is absurd. <laughs> he goes on, the atoms in our bodies may have been part of the body of someone else long since dead. When we die, our atoms will dissipate into the environment, and some, perhaps, will become part of another human being in a continuing pattern of recycling atoms. This is the only scientific basis, he says, for believing that we, the living, represent a form of reincarnation. In her fascinating book, The Quantum Self, physicist Dana Zohar echoes Hayfleck when she says, my body is made of atoms that were once stardust, and will one day find their home again amongst the distant galaxies. But so far goes uh, beyond the level of atoms to that of the subatomic realm and offers us a phrase that captures what Pop and McTaggart are all speaking about, I think, and that's the phrase quantum immortality. So then, within the, within the quantum field, the line is fine, if not non-existent, between animate and inanimate, or between life and non-life to say nothing of the lines between matter and energy or time and space. But let's zero in for a moment from the cosmic level and the quantum level alike and talk about death on a more personal level. Death in life is additionally enigmatic due to the fact that just as when we follow a story in a book or on the movie screen, we are always in medias res, between the end of our life and its beginning, a concept that is equally enigmatic as it is in fact in fiction. Here there are uh, authors like uh, Edward Said and some guy named Richardson, his first name I couldn't remember. <laughs> but maybe Beth. Yeah, the first Richardson. <laughs> Jack, maybe. Let's Bob. Jack. Let's Julia Jack. Richardson. I don't know. Uh, so, you know, you can ask when technically does my life begin? When I'm born? When I come out of the womb? Or before that, when dad's sperm met mom's ovum? Well, before that, when granddad's sperm met grandma's open, um, and my mother got her start in turn 98 years ago, and so on and so on, back and back ad infinitum. J. Hillis Miller reflects on certain ways, stereotypical ways, of ending works of fiction. For example, uh, with a marriage between the central characters or the death of one of them instead. As for the latter, he writes, death, seemingly a definitive end, always leaves behind some amusing or bewildered survivor, for example, reader of the inscription on a gravestone. In fact, death, he proposes, at least in fiction, is the most enigmatic, the most open-ended ending of all. Quote, it is the best dramatization of the way an ending, in the sense of a clarifying telos, law, or ground of the whole story, always recedes, escapes, vanishes. The best one can have, writer or reader, is Kermode's sense of an ending. So our death, it can be argued, is not ultimately part of our life. Our dying, yes, and we can only hope that it won't be long, drawn out, and painful, and that we'll have the good people of hospice with us. But our death, no. That said, our sense of death, which tends to intensify as we advance in years, can be a marvelous stimulus to review our life, as psychologist Eric Erickson proposed, with gerontologist Robert Butler close behind with his perception of life review as a universal and naturally occurring impulse as we age. Some question as to how universal that impulse is, but there's something, uh, I think, to what Butler's saying. This perception of, of people like Butler and Erickson has inspired much research and practice within, say, narrative gerontology in the realm of reminiscence and has encouraged those of us who are convinced of the value of narrative care with older adults of listening openly to older adult stories as a means of helping them to deal with the developmental challenges of later life. 
literary scholar Edward Said, whom I mentioned earlier, has con contemplated the impact of this sense of our death on the so-called late style of many painters, composers, and writers as they express their artistic vision in the latter stages of their careers. He writes about how death does sometimes wait for us, and it is possible to become deeply aware of its waiting. The quality of time alters then, like a change in the light, because the present is so thoroughly shattered by other seasons, the revived or receding past, the newly unmeasurable future, the unimaginable time beyond time. Edward Said's insights remind me of a concept proposed by Swedish gerontologist Lars Tornstam, and that's the concept of gerotranscendence. Some of the students here this evening will have heard me go on and on and on about that. For Tornstam, those in so-called deep old age manifest a qualitatively different way of experiencing time, self, and life in general. In particular, the lines between past and future, oneself and another, and life and death are all increasingly blurred. It's as if each side of each of those pairs leads into the other in our minds, not as the mark of cognitive impairment, but as a naturally occurring psychic shift toward the boundaries of our being. Indeed, we have tastes of such, of, we have tastes of such bleeding and blurring all throughout our lives whenever we resort to homespun sayings like, one door closes, but another one opens. One chapter ends, another one begins. Or it's always darkest just before the dawn. I have to insert a brief personal anecdote. I was mentioning this to Dolores earlier, that my mother, 98, uh, said to me recently, and by the way, she's surrounded by wonderful people, personal support workers at Windsor Court, and friends from the past and so forth. She's always getting phone calls from these people. She's making phone calls to those people. She said to me a few months ago, she said, Bill, you know what? What? I feel like I'm already halfway in heaven. And I thought, oh, does she have some sort of a premonition here? I said, what do you mean? She said, well, I feel like I'm already halfway in heaven because I'm surrounded by so many angels. I said, no. <laughs> but uh, to me, that's an indicator, maybe kind of sort of, of this Gerald Transcendence uh, concept that I've just been talking about. Before I shift to the topic of narrative openness, let me share some excerpts from a book that I recommend to everyone here entitled The Measure of My Days by Florida Scott Maxwell, uh, who at various times in her life was a psychologist, an actress, and a mother. It consists, the book consists of journal entries written in her mid-80s and reflecting on the life situation of the very old. She writes that, quote, we are people to whom something important is about to happen, unquote. Uh, we seem to lead the way into the unknown, she says. Quote, all is uncharted and uncertain. And then there's this zinger of a passage. It has taken me, says Scott Maxwell, all the time that I've had to become myself. Writing in her 80s. Yet now that I'm old, there are times when I feel I'm barely here. No room for me at all. I remember that in the last months of my pregnancies, the child seemed to claim almost all my body, my strength, my breath, and I held on wondering if my burden was my enemy uncertain as to whether my life was at all mine. Is life a pregnancy? If so, then that would make death a birth. Hold that thought for a couple of minutes. We're going to come back to that. Narrative openness in life, part three. The vision that motivates many narrative psychologists is that we experience our lives as stories that we're continually composing as simultaneously author, narrator, protagonist, editor, and reader. The key, though, is that we are inside of these stories. To quote Gary Morrison, quote, we can stand outside the narratives that we read, but not outside the lives we live. Psychologist Donald Polkinghorn puts the point, he was a speaker, by the way, at Narrative Matters 2012, no, 2014, 2014 in Paris, France, and that conference continues to go. Amazing. Anyway, he uh, puts the, the, this point that uh, Orson has just made a little differently in his landmark book, which I recommend to all budding narratives, narrativists, Narrative Knowing in the Human Sciences. He says, we are in the middle of our stories and cannot be sure how they will end. We're constantly having to revise the plot as new events are added to our lives. So, to try and encapsulate what I see as core concepts in a narrative perspective on human development and aging, we're always operating with 
or perhaps more accurately, within some sort of story about our lives. That story, or stories perhaps, can do and will change, to be sure. And as those stories do change, we change. Or as narrativists of various disciplines would say, our stories are inseparable from our lives, ourselves, our identities. These self-stories, these stories that we are living, that we are in a real sense making up as we go along, as works of what Morrison would call processional fiction, are continually, although sometimes dramatically and intentionally, being restoried or being regenerated for better or for worse. In other words, our stories can empower us or imprison us. Put bluntly, they can be weak or strong, thin or thick, rigid or flexible, closed or open, and they can be beset, perhaps especially in later life, which psychologist Mark Freeman calls the narrative phase par excellence, by any number of narrative challenges, among them narrative dispossession, which is a term that our own Clyde Baldwin has put forth, narrative domination, and narrative foreclosure. Narrative foreclosure, for instance, which older adults perhaps are especially susceptible to, has been defined by Mark Freeman as, quote, the premature conviction that our life story has effectively ended, that no new chapters, themes, or adventures are apt to open up. In a real sense, we did an epilogue time. Narrative foreclosure, of course, is a whole complex concept in itself, and there are various reasons why someone may succumb to it at any age, but that's a subject for a whole other lecture. Furthermore, we compose our own self-stories, directly or indirectly, in relation to the stories of others in our lives, parents, partners, children, friends, all of whom themselves, of course, are engaged in continual re-story. So as such, our stories and their stories are hopelessly and dynamically intermeshed. We are, in a sense, co-authors of each other, and where my story ends and your story begins is technically impossible to say. To go even further along these lines, we compose and recompose our self-stories within any number of intersecting, concentric, larger stories still. The stories of the families we're part of, the communities that we're members of, and the cultures and creeds that we've been shaped by. I had the hardest time putting this PowerPoint slide together, and I'm still not happy with it. And it needs a lot of other circles, but you get the, you get the point, I hope, okay? By a larger story, I mean a more encompassing narrative context or narrative environment or meta-narrative, as someone say, within which we live and move and have our being. So narratively speaking, none of us is an island. How we compose and comprehend our self-stories, not to mention how we story death itself, depends in significant measure on the nature of these larger stories that we live within. Above all, perhaps, the story of what we envision to be the proverbial grand scheme of things. Following the lead of scientists like Paul Davies, author of books like God and the New Physics and The Mind of God, the grand scheme of things is fundamentally, quote, an open system, which thus places creativity at the heart of the nature of things. According to, uh, alluding to things such as the butterfly effect, which I'm sure you've heard of, chaos theory and complexity theory and quantum indeterminacy, Paul Davies writes that, the intrinsically statistical, or if you will, chaotic character of atomic events and the instability of many physical systems to minute fluctuations, there's the butterfly effect, ensures that the future remains open and undetermined by the present. This makes possible the emergence of new forms and systems so that the universe is endowed with a sort of freedom to explore genuine novelty. As the geneticist Theodosius Dobshansky puts it, quote, the universe, in its emergence, is neither determined nor random, but creative. And I want to thank Don McDougall for drawing my attention to that phrase. Where are you, Don? There you go. In a chapter entitled, The Mystery at the End of the Universe, Paul Davies describes the mysticism that has been experienced by many of the world's most creative scientific minds, like, like those of Einstein, Heisenberg, Eddington in which physics, as it were, merges with metaphysics. Summing up the view of such thinkers, um, this is a quote from David Peet, also a science writer, in the book uh, The Mind of God by uh, Paul Davies. David Peet speaks of, quote, a remarkable feeling of intensity that seems to flood the whole world around us with meaning, that is, those who are oriented towards science, the frontiers. We sense that we are touching something universal and perhaps eternal. We sense that all boundaries between ourselves and the outer world vanish 
for what we are experiencing lies beyond all categories and all attempts to be captured in logical thought. From what I've been saying so far, I hope that we're starting to see how in the so-called grand scheme of things, which is itself an open creative system, or as the theologian Jürgen Moltmann would put it, an open creative process, we are intrinsically open creatures on several levels at once. To, re to reiterate, we are open on a physical level. Given that the molecules, atoms, and subatomic particles of our bodies are in continual interaction with the material universe around us through such basic processes as inhalation, exhalation, and perspiration, as ingestion, digestion, and excretion. You know what that's about. Okay? But we're open on the neurological level as well, or the level of consciousness, if you will. Despite tens of thousands of cells generally, and thousands of neurons in particular, dying on a daily basis, a sense of I-ness persists amidst this constant process of recycling and regeneration. And it could be argued that we are plugged into the overarching or underlying consciousness that McTaggart would say infuses the universe as a whole, the brain being far less a generator of such consciousness than a receiver for it. We're open hermeneutically or interpretively, too. While the events of our lives are what they are and cannot be changed, there's no end to the interpretations that we can place on those events. And I'm sure those of you who write about your life stories realize there's many different versions that can be told about a particular event in the past. So that there's no end to the meanings that we can glean from the past events, no end, therefore, to our development as meaning-making beings. Narrative development, says Mark Freeman, is thus a potentially infinite process. Or as I'm fond of saying, there's no limit whatsoever to how much we can grow old, not just get old, but grow old. We're also open on an intellectual level, in as far as in a universe as vast as ours, there are literally, apart from those we may place on our own curiosity, no limits to the things for us to learn, including learn about ourselves, which means that we're open autobiographically as well. And we are open both autobiographically and developmentally in the sense that we all have within us any number of positive of possible selves and unlived lives that could swirl around us, within us rather, calling to us, haunting us, seeding our souls with all manner of unfinished developmental business as we journey through life stages. To quote theologian and one time mentor of mine, uh, Don Kubik, we've talked about this person, slide. The stories we can tell about our lives have various subplots and loose ends. They are continually threatening to break down or become incoherent. We have to keep on improvising, stitching and patching, amending our histories. As mentioned already, we're open interpersonally too, in that where my story begins and your story ends is impossible to state. Story-wise, our lives are internet. Along similar lines, we are open generatively in terms of the ways in which, as gerontologist John Contra says, we outlive the self by contributing in some way, great or small, obvious or obscure, to the well-being going forward of our family, our community, our world, both while we're alive and after we're dead. Which also begs the question, of course, when, when in fact does my life end? And of course, as you know, I'm going to propose we are open on a narrative level as well. In fact, I see narrative openness as encompassing many of these other forms of openness. Not only are we, as Paul Kinghorn says, echoing Cuban, constantly having to revise the plot, but the very concept of a life story is itself open-ended. In the words of narrative scholar Charlotte Lind, and we had her actually as a guest at the Narrative Matters 2004 conference, I believe, the Delta Hotel. She writes in her book, Life Stories, uh, the creation of the creation of coherence. A life story is an open unit whose structure is not tightly constrained, which is both structurally and interpretively open. We change our stories at least slightly for each new audience. We change a given story for a given addressee as our relation to that addressee changes. We reshape stories as new events occur and as we acquire new values that change our understanding of past events. And we change our stories as our point of view, our ideology, or our overall understanding changes and reshapes our history." Unquote. Narrative openness is a key criterion of what Dan McAdams, 
not without controversy, calls a good life story. He says, a good life story shows considerable openness to change and tolerance for ambiguity. An open story propels the person into the future by holding open a number of different alternatives for future action and thought. When it comes to our life stories, nothing is ever final. Things can always change. And we can stand to be, perhaps need to be, more open. Jerome Bruner writes about the importance of keeping one's options open where one's self-narrative is concerned. Keeping narratively open, in other words, not narratively foreclosed, insofar as narrative foreclosure is linked to negative mental health, to depression, to despair. Restorings, major, minor and even major, are always possible, even in late life. Certainly identity work, and therefore story work, continues all life long. Put another way, no matter how much life review we may engage in, none of us ties up all the loose ends of our life stories or resolves all of our inner subplots and themes. Narratively speaking, we are also very much open systems. Gerontologist Harry Berman, who advocates for what he calls a hermeneutic gerontology, has this to say in his very intriguing book, Interpreting the Aging Self, which is based on his analyses of the journals of writers such as May Sarton and Florida Scott Maxwell. He writes, and what about the end? In the case of an older person, it may be necessary for the narrator or the, the journal keeper, the journal writer, to ask, is my story still happening or have I arrived at the end? As the horizon of self-understanding shifts, says Berman, it may become apparent that we're not in the middle of the story we thought we were in the middle of. Perhaps we thought our, all, perhaps we thought our life was a tragedy, and all along, unbeknownst to us, it was a romance. Or perhaps we thought our life was almost over, at least in terms of the future holding anything new, and it turned out there was a lot more to it. An insight that I think has huge implications for those who have put themselves forward as counselors of older adults. Perhaps my favorite quote regarding narrative openness is from our friend uh, in the narrative world, Mark Freeman. And the way that this, this concept or this quote under, under, underscores the way just as with works of literature, there is no end of meanings to be gleaned. He says, our lives are like richly ambiguous texts to be interpreted and understood, whose meanings are inexhaustible, whose mysterious existence calls forth the desire to know, whose readings cannot ever be yield a final closure. Unquote. Uh, by the way, there are, I have some copies of, of my notes, if that would be of interest to us, you write it down in your advance. That's a neat quote. Okay. So, last part of my talk, narrative openness in death. I said a minute ago that how we story and restory our lives depends in large part on the larger narrative context or contexts that we sense ourselves to live within. The same is true of how we story death. Maybe that would be my point. As narrative creatures, we have to situate death within some sort of storyline. One of the larger stories or meta-narratives that compels itself strongly to us as a resource to draw upon in storying life and death alike is that of science itself. And here's McTaggart again. I'm no offense to those of you who might have a Scottish background. <laughs> of all our stories, like McTaggart, it is the scientific ones that may most define us. These stories create our perception of the universe and how it operates. Yet, although we perceive science as an ultimate truth, she writes, science itself is finally just a story told in installments. New chapters refine and often supplant the chapters that have come before. So there's the version of the universe envisioned by Galileo, for example, which Newton's version superseded, only for Einstein's, Heisenberg's, and Hawking's progressively more encompassing and in a sense more exotic, more eccentric version <coughs> to overtake in turn. Yet even at that, Given the version that she sketches in her book, The Field, McTaggart claims that the story we've been told is about to be replaced by a drastically revised version. Quite enthusiastic, she's a journalist. A version according to which, quote, at our essence, from the quantum level to the social level and beyond, we exist as a unity, a relationship, utterly interdependent, the parts affecting the whole at every moment. 
If a quantum field holds us all together in this invisible web, then she says, we need to redefine what we designate as me and not me and reform the way we interact with other human beings. I would add, we need to redefine what we designate as life and not life, and thus reform the way we approach and interact with death. The story of the grand scheme of things that science tells us is thus a work in progress. In his book, The New Cosmic Story, Inside Our Awakening Universe, and I had Don McDougall to thank me for uh, having a peek at that book, one of the books that he brings in his pile every day to Tim Hortons, where we both do our stuff. <laughs> So in this book, The New Cosmic Story by John Hawke, uh, describes the universe as an unfinished story whose meaning is far from having been set in stone from the start. He goes on, as we follow a story, for example in a book, its meaning at any present moment may be dawning, but it still lies mostly out of range. Reading the cosmic story, he says, calls for a similar kind of waiting, a policy of vigilance inseparable from what some religious traditions call faith. Hout's allusion here to spirituality and faith would not seem out of place to certain voices in the field of medicine, in fact, that are questioning the dominant narrative within medicine that assumes this life is all there is. I'm not talking here about physicians such as Atal Gawande, uh, who to his credit boldly broaches the topic of death in his, to me, curiously best-selling book, On Being Mortal. I'm also referring to those uh, physicians such as Raymond Moody, MD, whose book Life After Life caused quite a stir when it first came out, as well as more recent physicians such as Jeffrey Long, MD. Uh, Jeffrey Long has established the Near Death Experience Research Foundation, otherwise known as the DERF, <laughs> which to date has collected extensive qualitative data from over 4,000 near death experiencers. Right? In his book God in the Afterlife, Jeffrey Long outlines the core elements of most near-death experiences, and we're familiar with them. For example, going through a dark tunnel, encountering a being of light, reviewing one's life, and feeling loved unconditionally. In the last sentence of the last page, Jeffrey Long concludes that near-death experiences, near-death experiences, reveal that death is not an end, but an opening to a wonderful afterlife. Now, he may overstate that wonderful afterlife, but it's an interesting point for them to conclude with. A conclusion that coincidentally most of the world's spiritual traditions arrived at some time ago. Even Alexander, these are not uncontroversial writers, so don't you know, think that I'm presenting them as a gospel, but it's interesting. Even Alexander, MD, an academic neurosurgeon who has taught at such institutions as Duke University and Harvard Medical School, was himself technically dead during a coma that lasted for seven days there due to a rare strain of bacterial meningitis. In his own bestseller, he's got a couple of them, but this one's called The Map of Heaven, he writes that, quote, when I returned from my journey, I was in many ways like a newborn child. I had to relearn who, what, and where I was. I was a different person from the one I had been. What had happened to me in the week I spent beyond my physical body had rewritten everything I, I thought I knew about all existence, unquote. I'd like to end my talk. Well, actually, end is the wrong word for all I've said this evening feels to me more like a beginning. <laughs> or a preliminary prolegomena to a beginning. I don't know. So I'd like to, though, offer an extremely tentative closure, an open closure, that is, in keeping with what has become my personal mantra, openness without expectation. By citing someone who is a man of science to the core, and yet also someone of the profoundest spirituality, Teilhard de Chardin. In his book, The Hymn of the Universe, Chardin writes that, quote, God, by the way, I accept that the word God itself can be problematic, can be a closed concept, to quote Eckhart Tolle, who proposes the term B, capital B instead. God, says Chardin, is vibrant in the ether and through it penetrates to the marrow of my material being, which to me is a vision that Tennyson captures with his phrase, closer than breathing and nearer than hands and feet. Replacing key words in Chardin's sentence here with language uh, from Hayfleck, McTaggart, Tolle, Zohar, and others, we could rephrase it then to say, 
being per se is vibrating in the zero point field or the quantum field and through it penetrates to the cells, molecules, and atoms of my material being, unquote. Given that Taggart's comment earlier about returning to the field upon death, here in a similar vein are a few more little quotes that are vintage Chardin. Quote, grant that when my hour has come, I may understand that it is you who are painfully separating the fibers of my being so as to penetrate to the very marrow of my substance and draw me closer into yourself. Death, says Chardin, who elsewhere views death as, quote, the ultimate communion, unquote. Death, he says, brings about in us the required dissociation. <coughs> death puts us into that state which is organically necessary if the divine fire is to descend upon us. Albert Banerjee recently shared with me an insightful article that he published in the journal Interculture, is that the correct name? Entitled, Speaking of Death, Representations of Death in Hospice Care, the paper reports on uh, Banerjee's or Albert's experiences as a participant observer in an ethnographic study of hospice care in British Columbia. In the paper, he reflects on the metaphors for death and dying that he found to be in circulation among nurses, family members, spiritual care providers, and the dying themselves. Not so much in palliative care, where death tends to be spoken of in more medicalized terms, but in hospice care. The metaphors that stood out were Death as a natural process, death as a part of a cycle of life, death as an opportunity for emotional and spiritual growth, death as a journey, and death as a birth. On this point, you'll recall Scott Maxwell's question, rhetorical question, is life a pregnancy? That would make death a birth. I may be becoming soft-headed in my old age, succumbing to what Ernest Becker calls the denial of death being persuaded by perspectives from science and religion alike that anyone in their right mind would dismiss as wishful thinking. <coughs> but I'm drawn very much to this image of death as birth, or if you will, as death as transition. Not termination, but transition. A transition to what? Pick a metaphor, any metaphor that works for you, depending on the philosophical or spiritual traditions you may be rooted in or have long since rejected, yet continue to be haunted by. It might be transition to Saeed's unimaginable time beyond time. Transition to the other side, to the next chapter, to the big adventure, to the great mystery. Quote, the hidden mystery in the womb of death, to use Chardin's cryptic words. A mystery as mysterious compared to this life as this life must be to the infant, brimming with creative potential and filled with futurity as it sets forth often kicking and screaming on the short but uncharted journey through the tunnel of the birth canal to the unknown that awaits it beyond. In its end lies its beginning. At this point in my life, and admittedly this may be me <coughs> defaulting to worldviews or meta-narratives in which I've been uh, shaped from early on but haven't yet properly critiqued, I do find this way of storying death enticing or how it diffuses some of the fear that the mere thought of death can engender in us. And perhaps replaces that sense of fear with a sense of wonder. It reminds me of Tornstam's notion of gero transcendence, whereby the older we grow, the blurrier the boundaries become between past and future, self and other, life and death. Accordingly, death starts to emerge as a matter less of de-storying than of re-storying less as the ending of our life stories, stories that are already amazingly open on multiple levels, than as their trance-ending instead. In any event, that's how I'll leave things for now, leaving you and me alike, I'm sure, with as many questions as answers, or like any story worth its salt with lots of loose ends. Thank you. <laughs> hard to believe that this is Bill's kind of introduction into exploring this area with how much knowledge she shared with us. Um, we have time for some questions, and then we'll have a bit more of a formal thank you to Bill, I think, if anyone has questions. I don't have any answers, by the way, but I'm <laughs> happy to hear the questions. An exploration. Great that we can go home. <laughs>
That wasn't a long enough silence for the, for the social. I'll ask a question. Yes. Someone else will. What prompted this as the next step in your journey of exploration? Right. I think my dad's death. Yeah, I was there when he died. It was a very intriguing experience. I won't go into details. But it did start me on a path of exploring topics that I've always been kind of curious about, intrigued by, and have lots of books on my shelves that I bought a long time ago but never really got around to reading. So I decided to start reading them. And that has become my bedtime reading for the last couple of years. It sounds a bit weird, morbid maybe, but uh, intriguing for sure. And uh, I mean, I'm open uh, to all kinds of uh, things. And some of them are pretty, you know, we have to read with a fair degree of skepticism, I, I, I would admit. But um, I'll tell you one quick story about my father, okay, which, which, which I've always carried around with me. I don't know if some of you may have known Dad, but uh, um, he, uh, he and Mother lived in Harney Station for a number of years after they retired, supposedly retired and never really retired. And um, Dad used to like to take a nap in the afternoon after lunch. And they had a dog, a kind of a, not a very pretty dog, but a lovely dog, Cuddles. Some kind of a terry with a smudged sort of face, but beautiful, wonderful personality, sorry. Anyway, Cuddles would always go downstairs and um, lie on Dad's belly as Dad had his little afternoon nap. This one particular afternoon, Dad reported to me afterwards. He had the experience of himself up above his own body, the ceiling level, looking down uh, at his sleeping body with his eyes closed. Um, and Cuddles was looking up, eyes wide open, as if to say, what are you doing up there? <laughs> we do know that animals, dogs in particular perhaps, are open to things that we don't necessarily pick up on with our uh, six senses, etc. So that it doesn't prove anything, but it, it, uh, it was something that I remembered as I began this exploration of the kinds of things that, that, we, that we explored this evening. That, that kind of began, prompted that exploration. And um, I don't know where it's going to take me, but uh, it's been fun. And uh, lots more to delve. I mean, I, like many of us, I'm interested not as a trained physicist or <laughs> cosmologist by any means, but I'm interested in those books that have come out and continue to come out by such scientists who are writing for a more general audience to get those fantastic ideas out there in a readable way for a wider audience. So I grab those things every time I go to chapters. If there's one on the book bargain section, boom, I take it home. And then maybe read it 10 years later. <laughs> if you keep watching Shetland, you're never going to get through it. No, that's two. But there's, I've watched three, three seasons, but there's two more. You know what's going on, don't you? Spoiler alert. I think a question here. Yeah, it's not really a question. I, I'm curious about your thoughts, because what I really liked about this talk was the way in which you're weaving through science and research and mm -hmm. religion and spirituality, and in a way transcending, talking about things that in the academy, I would, um, you know, I think you're not supposed to put together, yeah. or are difficult to put together. Train the bedfellows. Yeah. <laughs> And, and I remember being in Sweden and talking to someone who was working with Jero Transcendence. Yeah. And I had made, asked her about publicly at the conference about her work and looked like spirituality. And, and she was deeply offended at the thought that I suggested she was working in the realm of spirituality. <laughs> um, and so there, there is a boundary that I wasn't supposed to cross. And I'm just yeah. curious about this topic and those boundaries between yeah. And your own biography yeah. between research and science and religion. And if you have a reflection on that, a couple of things come to mind, Albert. Uh, great question, a great comment. Is that I'm I'm on a retirement trajectory, so I really don't care. <laughs> <laughs> but the other point, though, is that we're we're both we identify with gerontology as our home discipline, mm -hmm. which has a, been a great place to work and explore and so forth. But as can happen sometimes when you go to gerontology conferences, at least in North America, there's such a dominance of the biomedical healthcare model, which is perfectly fine and so forth, 
but you would really look hard through the through the booklet of presentation topics to find one or two or three on spirituality. Or if you do, it'll be couched in another language. Mm -hmm. um, um, by the way, can I just share with you, the, I went to a presentation at the Canadian Association of Gerontology two weeks ago, three weeks ago, in Moncton, and uh, there was, a, there was a, a scholar from Israel who gave a very thoughtful presentation on some work that her and her colleagues are doing, she and her colleagues are doing, a positive solitude um, as an important thing for many older adults to cultivate. Um, anyway, um, and at the end of her presentation. She said, and we're looking at another word to talk about positive solitude. And she put the word solitude mm. up on the, and I thought, wow, that's really wonderful. That's pushing in that direction. But, but for the most part, we have to be cautious and careful, lest we use words like spirituality, even if it's very broadly defined, mm. or words like religion. We have to be a little bit careful. I don't have to be careful <laughs> um, at this point in my life. But it, the paradigm, the, 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 the dominant paradigm, doesn't, isn't comfortable with that. Even, and as one of the students uh, in my other course, uh, Adult Adult Aging, who wants to do a, an essay for her term paper on wisdom, that's another topic that doesn't get on the radar as often as you would assume it would within academic gerontology, study of aging. Mm -hmm. uh, because it's hard to measure, it's hard to define, it's a, it's a kind of a motherhood and apple pie concept that we all kind of think there's something to it, but as to what that something is, it's kind of hard to say. So it does, it gets sidelined. I think wisdom, spirituality, meaning, um, those are terms that I think are, are fundamental to what we, the narrative gerontology, call the inside of the aging process. Mm -hmm. But, um, and I hope that, and I think in other conferences that you could go to, there's more receptivity to to those broader perspectives of the aging journey, the aging experience. Mm -hmm. Towards? Bill, uh, I guess uh, I've, I've been uh, kind of toying with the question for many years now, and uh, my other, my old mother's death, and she was in 97 at the time, and uh, anyway, she um, she was passing, and uh, the nurses were there and said that, uh, you know, it was imminent. Uh, so I thought, well, she sang to me all of my life, you know, as a, as a child and as an adult. And I thought, okay, she's going to heaven, I'm going to sing her into heaven. So I started to sing, and of course I was grieving at the same time. And so anyway, she had been basically not responsive for a while. And uh, then this little voice comes out and says, you're off key. <laughs> 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 so I've been questioning, okay, what calls somebody back? And in your studies, in your research, have you come across anything about, you know, the people who have come back from a dying process or from death itself? Have you ever come across um, some investigations into what does call them back? Uh, I, uh, That's a big question. Yeah, yeah, the, 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 the books that I've read, and I'm not saying that they're, you know, that they're top drawer academic scholarly publications, but they're certainly uh, enticing ones. And um, as to what calls those back who've had these near-death experiences, um, has, it seems to have something to do with unfinished business that they have to, things they still need to learn in this mode, shall we, shall we say. But um, what, what many of these books, uh, do report is that those who have had such experiences, and they're not uniformly positive experiences, some of them are, are troubling, but for the most part, those people who have had these NDEs come back with a different take on this life. Uh, they're, they're more at peace, uh, they have uh, less sense of stress and anxiety, they are more in the moment, uh, they're less materialistic, um, and uh, it, it's transformative. Been a transformative experience, so I'm, I'm drawn to that. You know? Anything I think that can help us to be kinder and gentler people, whether it requires you to get out of this life for a few minutes and come back in, or what, I don't care. Uh, anything that can help us to be gentler, nicer, kinder, more humane with one another, and the planet, that's all good. Probably have time for one more question or comment. 
there's any. And always the opportunity tomorrow morning as well. Do yes. Uh, just a question about the lived experience of approaching changes to our own narrative. What have you found supports people in being pliant with their own self-narrative? Being pliant with their own? Or, like, you say quiet or pliant? No, I said pliant, okay. to, but I said it quietly. <laughs> um, <laughs> to be able to change our narrative you know, it's, it's one thing to just say it in my head, and another thing to live it, really, mm -hmm. like a new narrative. Because yeah. there's something that you've found that supports people to really take on the new narrative as their story, not just a new idea that they're superimposing on themselves. Mm -hmm. I think uh, that's a great question. I think good listeners uh, is, is a key. <coughs> I mean, Michelle, you know about narrative therapy, for example, where you help a person to restory to a, a preferred narrative that helps them to move on with their lives by creating a community of witnesses that can support this new story. Uh, and in, uh, in say, a, a, a situation where someone is close to death, perhaps in a hospice context, etc., the listener, and I know we have such listeners here tonight, uh, who uh, is present and quiet and gentle and invites the individual, if they're in that space, to play with some alternative ways of thinking about the life as a whole. One of our colleagues uh, from Norway, Audgar Sinus, uh, has written a fascinating paper and call, entitled Nostalgic Stories, based upon his work. You've met him, Albert, I think, haven't you? Yeah, and you've met people who you know. Yeah. Uh, he, uh, has, he did his PhD uh, on uh, his experience uh, with poetry writing and story writing uh, with people who are dying. And one of the things he found really, really stood out for him in his research was the, the need that perhaps many have in the very late stage, if they are still are able to talk and communicate, but the important need that they had to tell what he called nostalgic stories. Little stories about when there was a little girl living, you know, in the fjord, and the family and I who used to go up in the field, you know. And, uh, sorry. And those stories kind of were, they weren't sort of grand life review exercises, but they took that person, it seemed to him at least, to the heart and the core, the best parts of their life. It was a way of reconnecting with important levels of, the, of, of themselves and their identities in the face of their opinion demise. Hmm. I, that's not really a response, uh, perhaps, but it's, a, it's a, something. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 